All right, open your Bible to Revelation chapter number 3. Revelation 3, we're getting close to concluding the first segment of our prophecy study together. Uh, we're moving through uh, the letter to the church uh, of the, uh, that's in Philadelphia, and then we'll go to the church in Laodicea, and then we're going to take two lessons and talk about the prophetic application of the Lord's letters to the seven churches. Now, those of you who are studying with us uh, on level one, that means you just show up, enjoy some fellowship, open your Bible, learn what you can learn as I teach the lesson, and hopefully grow in grace that way, and that's great. If you're a level two student, that means you've registered online. To do that, well, you go to our website, santamarialighthouse.org or baptistlighthouse.org. It's not real hard. You go on the website homepage, you click on the resources button, or you hover your mouse over the word resources on the top menu, you get a drop down there, and uh, the first one you'll see is LP Courses. That's not real intuitive yet. We'll fix that later, but that's just what it is for now. LP Courses. But that means it stands for Learning Press Courses. That doesn't mean anything to you either. So anyway, click on that, and it'll uh, open up to the Courses page. And since there's only one course posted, it isn't hard to figure out which one to choose. You choose the only course that's on the page, and then you go through a process of registration uh, if, if, to enroll. And it's not real hard to do, but if you'll do that, then you'll get, you'll get set up so that you can access the course online. You can follow the study guides, the study lesson guides. Uh, you can complete the quizzes, and as you complete them, you get scored right then and there. You get a couple of tries at it to get a passing score of 80%. You have to have at least 80 to move forward. And when you get done with all of that, you get a certificate of completion for that course of study. Uh, that's actually kind of level three. Uh, level two is just simply to register for the course. And uh, to do that, it's not hard to do. You just go to uh, um, registration. You hover your mouse over the, the word registration. There's a drop-down menu there. And we register for everything here. Uh, you register for getting a cup of coffee, and then you register to get a donut. If you don't have, a, if you don't have your registration, you can't get it. If you don't, if you don't. So we do have a lot of things you register for at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Forgive me for that, but there's a reason for it. <clears throat> but you, you go down there to where it says Know Your Bible. If you want to do the Know Your Bible thing, you find that one, click on it, you know, fill in the, complete the form that you see. It's real simple. And then you'll get a notification that you're registered. If you want to register for the prophecy course, same thing. Go to the same place, only you scroll down to where it says prophecy course. You click on that, you, f you complete the form, and you're registered. All right, that's how you register, and that's how you enroll. Now, let's roll. Revelation chapter number 3, we're going to begin at verse number 7, where it says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. So we're studying the second major division of the Revelation. Remember it divides as follows. Uh, chapter 1 is division 1. Chapters 2 and 3 is division 2. Chapters 4 through 22 is division number 3. And though that outline is provided for us in the Bible, Revelation chapter 1, 19 and 20. So we're going to look today at the Lord's letter to the church in Philadelphia. The Apostle John is commanded to write we read the verse, chapter 7, verse number 1, and you'll notice it says, And unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the way each letter begins, with only minor variations. Uh, actually, only two times does it vary a little bit. To the letter, uh, or the letter to the church in Ephesus, <clears throat> he writes it this way, to the, uh, to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Where, and then after that, it's always in, in Smyrna, in Pergamos, in Thyatira, in Sardis, in Philadelphia. Then you have another variation at the, in the last letter. He says there, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Now we'll make a little more of that when we get there, but it's interesting to notice these subtle differences, and each of these differences make a difference and suggest something to us, some insight to us, that we like to bring to your attention as we come to those places where those differences are noted. So it's unto the angel of the church of Philadelphia, and there's a relationship here between the seven angels and the seven spirits of God. But to remind you of that, 
It's a lot of controversy over, you know, what, what, does, this, what does this word angel uh, signify? Is it an angelic being, a, a ministering spirit, a spiritual being? Does it refer to the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God? Or does it refer to human messengers? Well, it's pretty clear after you study it out that it's talking about the bishop, the human messenger. And we know, of course, for example, in Matthew 11, verse 10, the same word translated angel here is translated messenger in Matthew 11, verse 10, and in three or four other places in the New Testament. Where is talking about a man? In the case of Matthew 11, 10, it's talking about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is referred to in the Bible as an angel. And other times in Scripture you find the word angel being used to identify a human messenger. So the word means messenger, basically. And in our New Testament, uh, in, in, the, in our King James Bible, usually if it's referring to a man, it's translated messenger. If it's referring to a spirit being, it's translated angel. Only our translators did such a remarkable job and every now and then, they went ahead and translated the word angel, even when it's referring to a man. If somebody said once some years ago, and I have lived in this book for so long, I can attest to it, the truth of it. The way these guys handled their translation is so remarkable. It's practically a study in Greek. If you study it carefully, with your Texas Receptus, you can do that, that's fine. But if you do that, You'll find it's amazing the job they did. It's just absolutely outstanding. And, uh, and we believe, of course, it's the perfectly preserved words of God in the English language. But that's for another time. We'll be going into that in, a, in, in another time. But it's just beautiful. Um, remarkable how you can do word studies with the King James Bible. And if you're, if you're careful and you pay attention, you can learn so much about the Greek language from a study of this English translation. It's pretty remarkable how that works. But the word angel is used to speak of human messengers, and we believe that these letters are written to the bishop of each church. Now the word bishop refers to the one that's presiding over, overseeing, watching over, ruling, leading, guiding, governing, whatever, managing, whatever word you want to use uh, that shows the idea of leadership. And of course we know that uh, the the human bishop of each church is little b bishop, and Jesus is the bishop of our soul, and the pastor is little s shepherd, but Jesus is the shepherd, the chief shepherd, the good shepherd, and so on. We understand that there's the headship of Christ uh, that overrules and overrides any human authority, not only in the church, but throughout the entire earth. But 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, uh, the Bible tells us in Acts 20, verse 28, put those verses together, and what you find is that the Holy Spirit of God is the one who ordains the presiding bishop for each church. That's very interesting because in Hebrews 13, 17, the Bible says that those who have the rule, those who have the bishopric uh, over us, they give an account. And you can see that illustrated right here where Jesus holds that bishop to account. He says to that angel, to the bishop of that church. He talks specifically to that angel. Of course, he talks to that angel about the church, but it, the pastor, we use the word pastor to identify the, the office I hold, the pastor is the one who's going to give an account. So please behave yourself. I don't want to get in a bunch of trouble on your behalf. Okay, but anyway, I'm being somewhat facetious, but you know what I mean. He writes to the church in Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia is about 25 miles southeast uh, of, uh, of Sardis. 25 miles southeast of Sardis in the vicinity of modern, and I don't know how to pronounce this word, Cilicia. I don't know. The Arab pronunciation escapes me sometime, but uh, it's S-A-L-I-H-L-I. -L -I, and it's a city in Turkey. And uh, we believe that uh, um, the, the Church of Philadelphia, about 25 miles southeast of Sardis, in a vicinity of modern, that name, about 75 miles east of Smyrna, modern Izmir. So if you've ever been to Turkey, you know what we're talking about. If you haven't, you have to look at the map to get some idea of where this is at. 
So right, Philadelphia is, was located where we have the modern day city al in Turkey today. The manifestation of Christ to Philadelphia. And by the way, that word means fraternity. It's usually translated the city of brotherly love. Um, the manifestation of Christ to Philadelphia is unique. It's different from any of the other churches. Now we've said that Jesus manifests to each church appropriately to the need of that church. You might remember, to Ephesus, he manifested as that one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and has the uh, and walks, excuse me, in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Well, that was perfectly suited to his warning to that church that if you don't repent, I'm going to remove your candlestick. We discussed that when we studied the letter to the church of Ephesus. Then to Smyrna, he manifested to that church as he that liveth and was dead. And that fits the need of that persecuted church that faced death every single day. And then to Pergamos, he manifested as that one that has the sword with two edges. And while that fit his warning to that church, that if they didn't take care of the heretics that were mingling in that, in that assembly, they weren't accepted in that assembly. They weren't given place in the assembly necessarily in terms of office or something like that. But they were tolerated within the assembly. Jesus said, if you don't take care of that, I'm going to come and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That's that two-edged sword that, uh, that John described coming from the mouth of Jesus in, in his vision of him. And then to Thyatira, he manifested as that one with feet of fine brass as if they burned in a furnace as, and as that one that had eyes as a flame of fire. And of course, that was fitting because to that church, he warned I've given Jezebel a place to repent or a space to repent. She's not done it. I'm going to cast her into a bed and those that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. I mean, he's judging that church and, uh, or, or Jezebel, at least in that church. And so that's fitting that he would be manifest to them as the one with feet of fine brass and, and eyes as a flame of fire. Well, to Sardis, he, he manifested as the one with the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And that's fitting to the need of that church because that church needed life. And the Holy Spirit, of course, is the life-giving force of God operating in our lives and through our lives and upon our lives and so on. And so that church needed a revival of the Holy Spirit. And then the interesting connection in that place there with the seven spirits, with the seven angels, shows the relationship between the seven spirits of God and the seven angels a relationship we discussed earlier when I brought to your attention that when he says to the angel of this church, the angel of that church, and so on, he's talking about that bishop who was appointed by that spirit. So there's a relationship between the seven spirits and the seven angels, seven angels being the seven angels of the seven churches and so on, the seven spirits being a representation of the fullness and the completeness, uh, the um, well, uh, go back to that word fullness. It's the best word. The fullness of the Spirit of God is represented in the seven spirits of God. So to Philadelphia, he represents himself as he who opens and no man shuts. And uh, as he who has the key of David, who is holy and true and faithful and stuff like that. Well, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. But none of those things connect to anything that we have in Revelation chapter 1. Whereas, in each of the prior cases, there is something in his manifestation that is connected to a representation of Christ in chapter 1. So Philadelphia stands out that way. Let me go over that again. Remember, in chapter 1, you have all these manifestations of Christ, the faithful and true witness, the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the ending. He who has the seven stars. And, and then the, the, the description of Jesus, the hair is white as wool and his eyes is flame of fire and all this stuff. In each of the manifestations from Ephesus all the way through Sardis, you'll see a direct connection to something said about Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. 
but not for Philadelphia. For Philadelphia, it changes. Remember, we notice how the order of the letters changed at Thyatira. The order of the letters. You have the letter to the church, and then you had, he that hath an ear, let him hear, and then you had the overcomer passage in the letter to the church of Ephesus, and in the letter to the church in Smyrna, and in, and in Pergamos. But when you come to Thyatira, it changes. He, he gives a letter to the church. He includes in it the promise of the overcomer, and then ends the letter with, he that hath an ear, let him hear. And we showed how important that change is because it changes at Thyatira and continues now through the rest of the, of the letters to the churches. Well, we have another unique thing that happens here, another kind of marker, if you will, in the progression, the development of the letters to the churches. All the way up until now, the manifestation of Jesus is always directly connected to something that was manifested to us through the Spirit, by the Spirit, through the Apostle John, in Revelation chapter 1. Until you come to Philadelphia. And then there isn't anything that connects you to any of the things said about Jesus in Revelation 1. Of course, I mean directly. Indirectly, it's obviously the same person. I mean, indirectly, it's obvious that the person John described is holy. It's obvious that the person John described is true. It's obvious that he's faithful. And it's obvious that the same person that he described in Revelation 1 is the person he's describing in, in Revelation 3, beginning at verse 7, who, uh, who holds the key of David and all this kind of stuff. So it's not that kind of difference. It's just interesting that, why? Why would there not be a direct connection to something mentioned in chapter 1 when consistently... In every letter up till now, there is a direct connection, pointer, to something in chapter number one. And I've got you wondering about that. We'll come back and tell you about it just a little bit. And then the church to Laodicea, he's represented as the amen, the faithful and true witness, which is fit for that church because that church was unfaithful. However, even with Laodicea, there's a little something different here. In the letter to the church of Ephesus and the letter to the church in Smyrna and in Pergamos and in Thyatira and in Sardis. There's something in that that, that goes directly to the vision John had or that he records in Revelation chapter 1 beginning at about verse 11 running through verse 20. In each case, remember that he had that vision, I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks and he that stood in the midst of the candlesticks, like unto the Son of Man, clothed to the foot with a so on and girdle about the paps with a golden girdle and all that, that whole description. Each of the letters refers back to that description until we come to Philadelphia and Laodicea. Neither the letter to the church at Philadelphia nor the letter to the church of the Laodiceans. Do you find any reference to that description of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1? Are those sorts of fine observations important? I think that they are. I believe that there are insights. You know, I, I believe the Bible is written in such a way that if you study it carefully, you'll see a lot of really neat stuff. If you pay attention. Insights sometimes are kind of buried in there. And, and they're available to those who take the time to look closely enough and, and to spend enough time with the passage to begin to become so intimately familiar with it, you begin to notice these little subtle changes and differences that come up, and then there are insights buried there, treasures to be had. And all of that is said to, to do this, to encourage you, hey, spend some time with your Bible. Spend some time in the Word. So, again... Something in the manifestation of Christ changes at Philadelphia. To, uh, to Ephesus, remember, he manifested himself as that one with seven stars and seven killed against six. To Smyrna, as he that liveth and was dead. And you can see that in Revelation 1 verse 18. To Pergamos, 
as the one with the two-edged sword. You'll see that in Revelation 1.16 to Thyatira as he with the feet of brass and, and uh, the eyes of flame of fire. You'll see that in Revelation 1.14 and 15. Sardis, uh, he, he represented himself as that one that has the seven spirits of God and seven stars in his right hand. Revelation 1.4 and verse 16. Laodicea, he is the amen, the faithful and true witness. You'll see that in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. But again, as I pointed out, that's the first time or the, that you'll see, with, except for Philadelphia, he doesn't refer to the vision, to the description. Hmm. So to Philadelphia, he manifests in a way that's unique from all the others. Philadelphia is the only church where there is no direct reference to anything in chapter number one. Something changes at Philadelphia, obviously. What is it? Well, we're going to go into this a little more in the last two lessons in this series where I talk about the prophetic application of the seven letters. We talk about how these seven letters have a prophetic message. But along the way, I'm going to salt in some insights we'll build on more fully later on. Let's do that now. I believe it does represent a unique dispensation of the church during the age of the churches. Where this particular church represents that time in church history where God has given an open door. He's just opened up the door of the gospel to go free, to be preached, all, I believe, all over the world. And that's very significant prophetically because we know, according to the Bible, in Matthew 24, Jesus said that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations and then shall the end come. One of the markers that show the conclusion of the church age is it completes its mission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And there's a prophecy in Matthew that declares the end follows that. When that gets done, then the end comes. And when we say the end comes, it doesn't mean that that's the moment when it's all wrapped up. No, the period or that time of the end has arrived. Or in other words, we move into that period during which the prophecies of Daniel are fulfilled. Is what that means. It's a period of time called, that referred to as the end. Not a day. It goes to a day. The period of that Time is the coming of the Lord to the earth, but that period begins at the end of this time of the churches. Colossians 4, verse 3, the Apostle Paul encouraged us to pray for us. He said that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. You can also see 1 Corinthians 16, 9. This concept of an open door is related to preaching the gospel, is the point. And so when Jesus gives to this church an open door, it is so that they can preach the gospel freely and openly. But wait a minute, all of the churches have been preaching the gospel. All of the churches have had open doors here and there. When Paul was in his ministry and he wanted to go to Asia, God said no. He wanted to go to Bithynia, God said no. God redirected him to Macedonia. So he had a closed door to Asia, but an open door in Macedonia. He prayed that God would give you him an open door here and an open door there. He referred to uh, times in his ministry when he had an open door. So the idea of having an open door isn't entirely unique to Philadelphia. All the churches had open doors here and there, so there must be something really, really significant about this church getting an open door. It must be something different than the usual open door policy that the Lord uses. You, get what, you follow what I'm saying? I believe what we're being told here is that the gospel barriers are just blown down and the gospel goes in this period of church history. I think it's what we're being told. Interestingly, Christ's manifestation to both Philadelphia and Laodicea is not taken from anything John brought out in his description of Jesus in Revelation 1, 11 to 18. You want to add to that the fact that Jesus makes a special promise to Philadelphia regarding the hour of temptation. Look at verse 10 in our passage that we're studying this morning. Jesus says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth, or dwell upon the earth. Well, what do you think he's talking about there? 
He's talking about a specific time called the hour of temptation, and it's a period of time that's going to bring a trial and a tribulation, if you will, upon the whole earth. And we know prophetically that refers to what we call the tribulation. When Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 15, that uh, the tribulation shall be shall come out shall come upon the world uh, such as has never been in the history of the earth, nor ever will be. And that's this hour of temptation that will come upon the whole earth to try them that dwell on the earth. And so Jesus made a special promise to the church of Philadelphia that they would be preserved from it. Hmm. I got to think this through a little bit, okay? You know, you get, think about it. Um, if the Lord means that uh, Philadelphia, you're going to be raptured and you're going to be delivered from that hour to come. But Ephesus, you're not, and Smyrna, you're not, and Pergamos, you're not, and Thyatira, you're not. And <coughs> that doesn't make sense. But if you think of it prophetically, it does make sense. Because prophetically, by the time we come to the period of Philadelphia, all the Ephesus period people have already gone. Think about this. All the uh, Smyrna people have already lived out their lives, their Christian lives. They've died and they've gone to heaven and they're waiting for the resurrection. Right? Likewise, the Pergamos crowd and the Thyatira crowd. They're pretty much gone. So my point there, if you're thinking of it prophetically, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, I'm anticipating some things we're going to look at more carefully in those two lessons where we talk about these letters prophetically. But I want you to think about this. You're at, you're at this letter of Philadelphia, and to that church, he says, I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation. That suggests that that hour of temptation comes in that period of time. It suggests that that's what would come up. Now, or in other words, that people living in the Philadelphia period of the church are going to be taken out to be delivered from that hour of temptation which is to come upon the earth. Isn't that interesting? And so, you contrast that to the warning to Jezebel and those associated with her, if you think about it prophetically again. Uh, he says, I'm going to cast her to bed and then with her to commit, that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. So to the church of Thyatira, he speaks of Jezebel, which we have shown is the seed planted in the church that grows into the great whore of Revelation 17. And we know from the Bible that she is in the tribulation. But remember, when he spoke to the church of Thyatira, he distinguished between Jezebel and her followers from the church itself. Remember? But to you and the rest in Thyatira that have not bought into her doctrine, I'm not going to lay on you any other burden. Okay, we're going to sort it out. We raise a few questions in this, I know, and I'll settle them when we get into this more particularly later on. But here's what I want you to kind of get hold of. Two times Jesus refers to the tribulation in his letters to the churches. One time when he's talking to Thyatira, and he says, not all of you in Thyatira, but some of you in Thyatira are going to go on in. Well, that tribulation didn't happen then. So he must be referring to a group within that church that becomes what well, we know he is. He's talking to a group within that church that becomes the great whore of Revelation 17 that's in the, that's in the tribulation. But he says to Philadelphia, I'm going to deliver you from that hour. I'm going to save you from that hour. And that suggests, when you think of it prophetically, that by the time we come to the church of Philadelphia, we're getting very near the wrap-up here. And interestingly, that's the church who receives the open door to preach the gospel without barrier throughout the world to, to fulfill and complete the prophecy of Matthew 24 that tells us that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations and then the end will come. Yeah, you put it all together, it starts getting really interesting. He manifests to Philadelphia as he that is holy, he that is true, and he that hath the key of David. Each of these particulars in his manifestation relate significantly to the declaration that follows it. 
He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Openeth, excuse me. So the command to write comes from him who is holy. And that word means separated. That means, that it comes from a Hebrew word that means to cut and to separate or to sever. And uh, that comes up in the Greek word, which means sacred. And the word sacred means that which is separated or set apart to God. So the Greek word sacred means the same thing as the Hebrew word holy. And of course also the Greek word the hagios is translated holy and sacred interchangeably because they mean the same, the same thing. So the idea is, of course, that Jesus Christ is separated from the world. Even though he's in the world by this, his spirit dwells in us and we're in the world. But he told us, he said, you know, even as I uh, am in the world, but not of the world. So you are in the world, but not of the world. So we're in it, but not of it. Holiness. It's very, very important. He that is holy. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse number 14, follow peace with all men and holiness. Listen to this, without which no man shall see the Lord. You don't get to see God without holiness. Matthew 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that shows the connection, the relationship between purity of heart and holiness. It is the only divine attribute that's communicable to man. We, call, we refer to the non-communicable attributes of God. That would be omnipresence. God can be everywhere at the same time. All right? We can't do that. Uh, then um, omnipotence. I want to save omniscience for last. I keep trying to say omniscience first. Omnipotence. All power. Only God is all powerful. No human being has all power. And then omniscience. Only God is all knowing. I wish someone would tell. Anyway, never mind. I don't want to go there right now. Omniscience. Only God knows everything. All right? Those are non communicable attributes. But here are some attributes that are communicable. God is love. We're supposed to love too. God is true. We're supposed to be true also. These are the communicable attributes. And here's another one. Holiness. God said, be ye holy even as I am holy. It's a communicable attribute. It's something true about God that God desires to see true in us. God wants us to be holy. And so to be holy, we need to take this exhortation from 2 Corinthians 7, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 particularly, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It's a progressive thing. The Bible says in Romans 12, in other words, I go back to that word, perfecting holiness. In other words, there's a process we go through to perfect our holiness or to complete it, to bring it to completion. In Romans 12, verse 1, talks about one of the very important first steps. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We're to maintain this vessel so that it's usable by the Lord. And so we must... Purify ourselves, purify our hearts, cleanse your hearts, cleanse your hands. The Bible says repeatedly, we're to use 1 John 1, 7, 8, 9, and then Romans chapter 8, use 1, 1 John 1, 7, 8, 9 to get clean. If we confess our sins, he's faithful just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Use Romans 8, walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Mind the things of the Spirit, not the things of the flesh. We need to exercise ourselves in that, that we might be holy so that if we will purge ourselves from these things, for 2 Timothy 2.21, then you'll be a vessel of honor, sanctified, which means holy or set apart, and meet, that means fitting and useful, for the master's use, the Bible says, and prepared to every good work. So we need to be holy. Jesus is holy, and that means he stands outside the world, although he works in it. And we are not of the world, but we work in it. And so we need to be sanctified by His truth. Jesus said in His prayer in John 17, Father, sanctify them by Thy truth. And then He said, Thy word is truth. And man, what a very important, basic, very practical truth to, to get hold of. We're sanctified by His truth. 
His word is truth. You get into the word of God, you connect with the mind of God, and you get insight on the heart of God, and then you bring your mind under his mind, your heart under his heart. You, you read the word of God and hear what God says to you to do, and then you obey it. That's a process. As you grow in your knowledge of his word, of his will, and of his way, and you conform yourself more perfectly to his will and to his way, you are in a process called sanctification. And you will become more and more holy. And the Bible says, uh, it, it, it teaches us in principle that, you know, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So you can take from that a principle that as you grow in your holiness, the more fully you will see him by faith. And the more deep your relationship will be with him, and the more intimate, and the more connected, and the more personal you will be in your relationship with God. Because he, he, he meets with you on holy ground. Moses, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground in my presence. That's a principle we're supposed to learn from. It doesn't mean you have to take your shoes off in church. What it means is, in principle, that drawing nigh to God, you leave your shoes outside type thing. In, in principle. You don't come to him in the flesh. So he commanded, he, he who commanded John to write is he that is true. And, and every shade of the meaning of the word truth would be, would, would be part of that. Accurate, exact, loyal, faithful, honest, in accordance with fact or reality. The word translated truth is related to the idea of transparency, interestingly enough. Jesus declared himself to be the way, the truth, and the life. And when he returns to the earth, he is announced as he that is faithful and true and righteousness, doth he judge and make war, Revelation 19.11. Those who gathered on the sea of glass mingled with fire in heaven will testify. His ways are just and true. Revelation 15, 2 and 3. It's the witness of all the angels of heaven. Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteousness are thy judgments. Revelation 16, 7. Indeed, the, all the host of heaven will combine together with one voice and say, For true and righteous are his judgments. That's over and over and over again in the Revelation. This is brought out. He is true. And he is the true light, we know. John chapter 5, 22, he's the true bread. John 6, 32, he is the true vine. In John 15, verse 1. And he that is true seeks true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's look at that key of David as we conclude. The command to write comes from him who holds the key of David. Right, David? Amen. Amen. The key of David is held in the hand of our King Amen. and our Lord. Open your Bible to Isaiah 22. Look at verse 22. You might wonder about that key of David. Hmm, what's that about? Well, Isaiah 22, verse 22, gives you some insight into what is this key of David The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 22, And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open, and none shall shut. And he shall shut, and none shall open. It's obvious the connection between that prophecy and this verse that we're looking at here in Revelation. To the house of David, God has made the promise of the kingdom. And this refers to having authority over all the kingdoms of the earth. And we've done a lot of study on, on, the, on, the, on the kingdom and all that. And you'll be able to appreciate a lot more easily my comments right now if you've been with us through all that study. Others of you, you, you know, just listen up and then and catch up. Uh, but anyway, uh, Satan held, remember, all the kingdoms of the earth under his power. Matthew 4, 8 and 9, Luke 4, 5 and 6. And after our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus declared that all power in heaven and earth is given to him. In Matthew chapter 28, 18. So now Jesus is the ordaining power behind all principalities and powers in the earth. Romans 13, 1 to 6 applies to him. The Lord, with this key in his hand, because all power is given unto him, you see. That's represented by him having this key. The Father promised, I'm going to put the key of the house of David in my son's hands. Now, this gets a little interesting. 
But what happened, you know, Judah was the scepter bearer, right? Well, we know God took the kingdom from Judah and gave it to Nebuchadnezzar. Well, Jesus comes along, he dies on the cross of Calvary, was buried, rose, rises from the dead. He now is given all power in heaven and on earth. The key is his now. He has the key. Because that key of the kingdom was the right to preside over the nations of the earth as God's appointed king, as God's appointed kingdom. The bottom line is the Lord has, with this key in his hand, has commanded his soldier ambassadors, 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 2 Corinthians 5, 20, put those verses together for soldier ambassadors, to go into all the world and teach all nations, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. He says, all power is given unto me, you go and teach all nations. He commands us to go under his authority and to teach all nations. And finally, he that commands John to write declares he has used this authority that he's been given to open a door that no man can shut to this particular church. Amen. So you see how it all comes together. Our Lord Jesus Christ opens a door to the church of Philadelphia. He, he explains why. I'm going to go ahead and freelance this next section here, all right, because I need, I need to conclude. Uh, he tells us why he opened the door to this church. Let's look at it real quick. Uh, he says in uh, verse number, uh, chapter 3, verse number 7, To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy is true, he that hath the key of David. He that openeth, no man shutteth, and shutteth, no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For th Here's why. For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Now, my notes go into great detail on this in your course text. Also, the crib notes go into farther detail than I'm going to go into right now. But the bottom line is there's a reason Jesus did this for this church. It's because. Because this church had, had been faithful, had not denied his name, and had not given up on the hope of his return. That's what that's meant by that. Uh, keeping in, uh, the word of his patience. He says, I'm going to make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and to worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So there's a very special relationship he has with this church. And there's a reason for it. He gives us the reason for it. He says, you've got a little strength. You've kept my word. You've not denied my name. And so the synagogue of Satan uh, refers to those who call themselves Jews and they're not. Now that can be a reference to the Jewish people because of Romans 2, I think it's verse 28, where it says, for he is not a Jew that is one outwardly, but he is a Jew that is one inwardly, and so on. So some people would apply it that way. But my notes go into detail to explain why I don't think that's what's being said here. I believe this is talking about that notion some have, that the Gentile church has taken the place of Israel. It's called replacement theology. My course text goes into great detail and offers a little separate study on that whole issue, and you ought to read it. But we don't believe in that doctrine of replacement theology. We do not believe the church replaces Israel. God's plans and promises to Israel continue to unfold and continue to, uh, we, we have a continued expectation that they're all going to be fulfilled. So God's program for Israel is going to be fulfilled just as he outlined it in the Bible. The church is a mystery. It was a secret kept in God's heart from the beginning and only revealed in, in our time. And it's a special uh, calling together of a people who are to be identified in a very special and intimate way with Jesus Christ as the groom and the church as his bride. So that's what the church is about. It's a separate thing. And so we don't believe the church takes the place of Israel. Here's what it says. <laughs> Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan and say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Why? Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. And that I show is a reference to the hope of his return. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world, to try them to dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. It's interesting. He says, you know, it's, it's just interesting how he brings that up in connection with this promise to keep them from the hour of temptation. 
he connects them together in a very interesting way. And my notes go into that in some great detail. Behold, I come quickly, I hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And he goes into the overcomer passage. But let me just wrap it up this way. Here's, here's the, a main thing I think you should go home with out of this lesson. You see the conditionality here of the Lord. Um, I've opened this door for you. Here's why. You're this way, you're this way, you're this way. There's reasons. There are reasons, excuse me. Say, uh, There was a long time when it was real popular to emphasize the unconditional love of God. As if that meant that it didn't matter how we behaved, but it does matter how we behave. Of course, God's love remains constant. But, obviously, he didn't say this to any other church. I'm going to let everybody know that I loved you. He didn't say that to any of the others. He said it to this one. Why? He told us why. Here are the reasons. When he chose Abraham, he told us why. I know him. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. My point is, you need to pay attention to how you behave because it matters. It makes a difference.